So as we continue our study of the Gospel of John, we're going to finish up chapter 18 and begin verse 19. So our verses will be chapter 18, 38 through 19, 6 of the Gospel of John. Jesus is standing for Pilate. And we read in verse 8 that Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? When he had said this, he began, went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But you have a custom that I should release unto you one over the, at the Passover. Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plowed a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went, uh, went forth again, saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came forth Jesus, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto, the him, unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priest therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Well, let's pray. We'll pray silently together. That's our custom. And then we'll look at these words. Father, help us to quiet now our hearts and our minds so that we might listen to the Spirit of God as he teaches us from his word. And we ask, dear Spirit, that you will speak to us. Speak to us just as if Jesus Christ is speaking to us today from his very word that you inspired. Help us to learn from it. Help us to grow from it. Help us to change from it. And may lost people be convicted and saved by it. In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. So the New Testament clearly teaches that the crucifixion of Jesus took place to fulfill the Passover feast that was being celebrated in Jerusalem that, those very days. Paul wrote about this very specifically in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, where he said, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And this connection means that we can look at Jesus to try to understand the true meaning of the Passover, and also we can look at the Passover to understand correctly Christ's work of atonement. The instructions for the Passover specifically said that the sacrificial lamb shall be without blemish in Exodus 12:5, And this requirement is seen here in the trial of Jesus. Just as the Passover lambs were kept in Israelite homes for three days of examination, Jesus Christ was carefully observed during his three-year ministry. At his baptism, God the Father pronounced that Jesus was unblemished as he spoke audibly from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The disciples, who lived as closely to Jesus as anyone, later described him as holy, as righteous, and without blemish and without spot. Even Judas Iscariot confessed, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood there in Matthew 27, 4. Last of all, the Roman procurator Pontius Pilate three times said, I find in him no fault at all. There in John 38 and in chapter 19, verses 4 and verses 6. It is an uncondemned and blameless Christ that goes to the cross to die as our sacrificial lamb. It is God's lamb without blemish that dies for your sin and mine. Now we might think that such a spotless person like Jesus would be well liked for those to whom he came. 
at the beginning of John's Gospel, however, he warned us not to think like that. John wrote, he came into his own, but his own received him not. Harry Ironside, a famous preacher in history, he taught about this truth with this story of two sermons preached at a church one Sunday. In the morning, there was a visiting preacher, and he gave a, a marvelous oration on the heavenly beauty of virtue. And he ended with this. He said, Oh, my friends, if virtue incarnate could only appear on earth, men would be so ravished with her beauty that they would fall down and worship her. And of course, many people were impressed with his stirring oration and they returned that evening to hear a gospel ministry preach about Christ crucified, this time from Harry Ironside. And he closed by saying, my friends, virtue incarnate has appeared on earth and men, instead of being ravished, cried out, away with him, crucify him. So as the preacher explained, man in his sin hates God's holiness and will do anything to rid themselves of the light of Christ. This is why Jesus, the Lamb of God, appeared before God's ancient covenant people only to be despised and rejected. As chapter 18 comes to a close, Pilate has examined Jesus in light of the charges brought against him by the Jewish leaders, and he has acquitted him of all guilt. An official pronunciation, he is not guilty. Instead of releasing him, however, Pilate turned to speak to the crowd that had gathered outside the praetorium, his official residence. And he told them, but ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover, Will you therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now it's very clear that Pilate wanted to avoid making a decision about Jesus, and he was trying to find a way as best he could to release his prisoner. And so he put the matter in the people's hands. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Now according to Mark's gospel, Pilate named Jesus king of the Jews, and he did so to show his contempt for the priest's petty hatred toward Jesus. He mistakenly assumed that the crowd would choose to let Jesus go, but he, had, he must have been surprised when he heard their violent answer. They cried out again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. You can hear them saying, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. John explains that Barabbas was a robber. Most likely he was an insurrectionist who was one of the zealots who wanted to oust the Roman power by means of guerrilla warfare and needed uh, money to finance this operation through robbery. That's the kind of man Barabbas was. Pilate and his soldiers would have considered him to be a terrorist. Uh, these zealots went around slitting the throats of Roman soldiers, uh, trying to be uh, to get rid of them any way they could. If we read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 16, we see that Barabbas was a notable prisoner. And in Luke's Gospel, he said, who for a certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. So he's a robber, he's a murderer, he's a seditionist, he's a bad dude. And the Romans don't like him at all. Barabbas was therefore the last person that Pilate would want to set free. But having been promised the release of a prisoner, however, the Jewish mob was intent. Was intent. They were stirred up by the religious leaders who were there, according to Mark 15, 11. So Barabbas would have to be released instead of Jesus. Keep that in mind. We're going to talk about Barabbas a little later on. But Barabbas was the kind of savior that the Jews wanted Jesus to be. They wanted him to be an insurrectionist and help to overthrow the Roman government. They wanted him to be a political and military deliverer from the Roman occupation. Barabbas was trying to do that. Jesus wasn't living up to what they wanted. 
Remember when Jesus recently had rode into the city on a humble donkey and Jesus declared that he was the heir to David's throne and also how he rejected a worldly violent agenda? He didn't come to overthrow Rome's legions, but he came to overthrow the power and the guilt of sin. The people chose Barabbas over Jesus' salvation by sword over salvation by the cross. J.C. Ryle wrote, They publicly declared that they liked a robber and a murderer better than Christ. The hypocrisy of the religious leaders uh, uh, was thus highlighted as they incited the crowd to demand the release of, of a man who was guilty of the very crimes of sedition and rebellion that they had accused Jesus of being guilty of. Peter would later lay this charge against them in Acts 3-4, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted to you. Now the crowd's rejection of Jesus not only involved the will of sinful men, but also the will of God for his sacrificial lamb. You'll recall from your Old Testament studies on the Day of Atonement, Israel's high priest would lay his hands on the scapegoat, transferring the guilt of the people's sins onto that goat, and then they would reject it and remove it from the camp. That's all spelled out in Leviticus 16. Thus, Isaiah prophesied that Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors and bear the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Spurgeon, in one of his sermons, points out that in this capacity, the crowd's rejection of Jesus spoke forth the will of God, since Christ, as he stood covered with his people's sins, had more sin laid upon him than that which rested upon Barabbas. It's true that in himself Jesus was without guilt, as Pilate has said. Spurgeon went on to say, holy, harmless, and undefiled is Christ Jesus, but he takes the whole load of his people's guilt upon himself by imputation, and as Jehovah looks upon him, he sees more guilt lying upon the Savior than even this atrocious sinner, Barabbas. Now, as procurator of Judea, Pontius Pilate had the full authority to set him free. He didn't have to listen to these people. He said, I don't care what you Jews think. I don't care what you say. I'm letting them go. The fact that he didn't have an already declared Jesus innocent reveals Pilate as a moral coward. He's, he's corrupt in his use of power. But Pilate had another trick up his sleeve for winning over the crowd in order to release Jesus, which is exactly what he wanted to do. Uh, the injustice of this, the, this injustice of this idea is evident from the opening words of chapter 19. Chapter 19 and verse 1 says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. I can't let him go, so let's do this. Having been rejected by his people, the Lamb of God would now be abused by this worldly leader. And we know that behind all of this cruelty was the prince and the power of this world, Satan himself. Now, the Roman practice of scourging, we've talked about this in the past, but let's review it in our minds, that this was a horrific physical form of punishment. They used a whip with leather tails that had attached to it bone fragments and pieces of metal. There were three types of flogging practiced by the Romans, and they had three different names for it. First, there was the lightest form called the fustigation, which was a mild, or mild form of beating, and it really just served as a warning against criminals. This is what might happen to you if you steal something. You'll get this. It's, it's going to hurt, but it isn't going to kill you. Uh, next was the flagellation. This is a more brutal flogging for moderately severe crimes. 
You're not just going to have a few stripes. You're going to have a lot. And this is going to be very, very, very painful to remind you not to commit these kind of crimes. And then third, and worst of all, was the verbal ratio. This was a terrible, often fatal scourging that not only stripped the back of nearly all of its skin, but it dug into the tissues of the back and it exposed arteries and bones. It was that severe. It inflicted anguish, and the intention there was to hasten the execution that was going to follow. If you receive the horse, this, this verbal ratio kind of beating, you were going to die, either from the beating or from the crucifixion to follow. Now, it seems likely at this point that Pilate used the lightest form of scourging. The other Gospels record that Jesus received the most severe form later on after Pilate had delivered him to be crucified, which explains why Jesus was physically too weak to carry his cross. But the flogging that John's referring to here took place before Christ's ultimate condemnation. Pilate's still trying to save Jesus, and so he administered a milder but still terrible beating that he hoped would satisfy the crowd's bloodthirst and teach this troublesome rabbi a lesson at the same time. The Gospels don't go into a lot of detail about Christ's physical agony, but we can be assured that this flogging showed Jesus' bravery to go along with his innocence. Added to this injury was the insult that the Roman soldiers assigned to flog Jesus did. John briefly tells us of their mockery in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 19. The soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. First, the soldiers put a crown of thorns on Jesus' holy brow. Now, it's impossible to know which kind of thorns were used for this mock coronation. Many commentators suggest that it was made from the branches from the date palm, since they contained very sharp spikes, almost as long as a foot. And that crown uh, uh, would, would cause Jesus excruciating pain, but it would also picture an, Im an image of radiance, radiant beams extending outward, which was a common for the crowns worn over the rulers at that time. So we don't know for sure. We never will until we get to heaven. But that makes sense to me. To this royal mockery, the soldiers added a purple robe or a cape to show contempt for the idea that Jesus might be a king. And finally, the soldiers came to Jesus one at a time, faking homage, rising from their mocking bowels to strike his head and his face, no doubt increasing the pain of the thorns with blood streaking down Jesus' face at the time. According to Mark, the soldiers also spat on Jesus and used a reed that they had put in his hands as a scepter to batter their prisoner with. How does one explain that kind of savage treatment of one so holy and one so admirable as Jesus? One answer is that the Romans held the Jewish people in contempt. And since Jesus was called their king, they wanted to show their hatred for the Jews and their purported Messiah that they were always talking about. That explanation alone, however, is not sufficient. These soldiers were personally faced with the majesty of the Lord, a majesty that could only have continued to shine even in the midst of this torture. On the head, destined to wear heaven's crown of glory, mankind pressed a torturous crown of unbelieving contempt. How great a condemnation the soldiers' mocking brings, not only to them, but on our entire cursed race. There's a sobering theme that runs throughout John's gospel. It was stated in John 3, verse 19. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, 
because their deeds were evil. This is the verdict of God. This is human nature as it really is. Barbaric mankind ridicules divine humility. Rebel mankind mocks Christ's reign as king of kings. And though Jesus is no longer physically present to abuse, the spirit of these Roman soldiers continues to raise its fist against him and often raises its hatred against the disciples that are still in the world today. You and I, they shake their fist at us. They shake their fist at him. Every time they have a, a gay day parade march, they're shaking their fist in the face of God. And those who might say, this is not right, they shake their fist at us. The same mentality of these Roman soldiers still exists today. Now I want to mention here as well, why the Apostles' Creed lists the abuse of Jesus as one of the great events in the history of salvation. The Apostles' Creed reads, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. This physical abuse and public ridicule was part of what Jesus suffered for us in bearing our sin. It started before the cross, folks. The thorns on his fake crown remind us of the curse of the creation for Adam's sin found in Genesis 3.18. Not only was he wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities, as Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he also bore the shame and reproach that our sin deserves. So it's all part of the payment for, for sin. J.C. Ryle wrote, Our Lord was clothed with a robe of shame and contempt that we might be clothed with a spotless garment of righteousness and stand in white robes before the throne of God. When the soldiers' rough work with Jesus was done, Pilate stated his purpose before the crowd in verse 4. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Don't know what the people expected to see at this point, nor do we know how they initially reacted when came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and purple robe. So they hadn't seen all this beating and all this stuff. Now they see the result of it, the throne, the purple robe, the blood. His voice thundered through the ages of history in the way Pilate himself could hardly imagine. The Roman judge set forth Christ the King, battered, bloodied, and disgraced in mockery, and then he cried out, Behold the man! Behold the man! This was an attempt to make Jesus appear to the Jews as ridiculous and harmless so that they would drop their charges against him. So Jesus is brought forth as a caricature of a king, and Pilate, in essence, is saying, this is your man. Look at this pitiful figure that you want crucified. But to the mind of John, the entire thing is a sad picture of a man who claims that he is indeed the king of truth. John wrote, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And here we see the extreme consequences of those very words, folks. Now, look at how Jesus, the Jewish crowd responded to their long-awaited Messiah. Pilate set forth Jesus in the manner that Isaiah the prophet foretold. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Seeing him, the crown, the blood, the robe, the mockery, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! 
there in verse 6. Not one of those shouting could point to any harm that Jesus had done. Instead, he had often done them so much good. He had healed many of them. He had taught them. He had freed them from false doctrines and false shepherds. Everything he did was good and righteous and holy. Why then did the Jews hate Jesus so much that they cried out for him to be cruelly put to death on the cross? We have already mentioned their hatred for Jesus' holiness, which exposed their depravity. And Paul adds that despite their privilege of possessing the scriptures, the holy word of God, they were blinded by sin. Not recognizing Jesus as the Messiah, he was, Paul wrote, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2, 8. They didn't know it. They didn't believe it. They were blinded. They couldn't get it. They couldn't understand. The famous Latin words that translates Pilate's words, behold the man, are ecce homo. That's what came out of his mouth. Ecce homo. Challenging us all to look at Jesus, the sin-bearing Savior. We've mentioned that Pilate has already acknowledged him as sinless and without guilt. We have speculated about how the soldiers must have seen his sheer bravery as he endured their whip. Would they also have seen his majesty shining through the misery? Would they have? It's hard to imagine that they didn't, yet they still crucified the Son of God. Pilate's cry was heard not only by the Jewish crowd, but it reverberated through the history of the Word of God, the Holy Scriptures. His words, behold the man, we find the answer to the long-awaited expectation of God's people for the promised Savior who is to come. We remember the dreadful scene outside the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were expelled for committing the first sin, breaking God's covenant, and casting all of humanity into the fall. But God in his grace has spoken of a Savior who would be the offspring of a woman. God spoke to him, to Satan, in the garden. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Here is the man, God declared. The first thing we need to know about him, he's going to be a human. He's going to be the son of a woman. The generations passed. And in the day of Moses, God said once more, Behold the man. This time he foretold this man's going to be a prophet, one like Moses, who would speak from God to the people. God told Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him, speaking of Jesus Christ. Later still, he's shown to David as a coming king, sitting on a throne, wielding royal power, God told David, and we studied this recently in 2 Samuel 7, He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. We're beholding the man. We're beholding him as a prophet, and we're beholding him as a king. In the time of Zechariah, when the returning exiles from Babylon were rebuilding the temple, the promised Savior was revealed regarding his priestly office. Now, remarkably, Zechariah was told by God to make a crown woven with silver and gold and to set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua. That's the Hebrew name Joshua is Yeshua, which is Jesus. Once the crown priest was sitting on the throne, here's what Zechariah was to do. He was to point out to him and cry out this, the same words. Behold the man. 
whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Isaiah 6, 12 and 13. Behold the man as a king, as a prophet, and now as a priest. Zechariah knew that this was a symbolic act regarding another who was to come. But even as he cried out, behold the man, he must have wondered when the Messiah would appear. His heart burning to see the day when this priestly king would be revealed before the watching eyes of God's covenant people. If Zechariah was there, he would have been horrified and stared at Pilate as Jesus stood before him when the prophet had stood before his earlier namesake. The purple robe there and the crown was there, but it was all so horribly different than what Zechariah had prophesied in his own mind. And yet the voice cried out just as Zechariah did, Behold the man. And the Messiah was presented to the people of God who led by their chief priests and officials answered, Crucify him. Crucify him. Would Zechariah have been mortified by his prophecy's fulfillment? Or would he have marveled to see in it the true message in the Bible? Would he have realized that God was building his true temple where man can meet with God in the person and the work of his bloodied, sin-cursed son? Why this? Why this? Because Jesus' suffering and death were suited to our need that we as sinners might be forgiven and that we as rebels might be restored to God's love. Zechariah wove a crown of silver and gold for his priestly king, but how much more precious is this crown of thorns that Jesus wore for us? Behold the Lamb, our true priest, who ministers peace between a holy God and guilty man. Behold the crown thorn king who out of love was willing to die. Behold the gospel of God's true prophet offering cleansing through faith in his own blood. Behold the man, Jesus Christ, God's son, the true temple where God will meet with man here and here alone, fulfilling his ancient plan to save his people from their sins. I want to consult one last person. While Jesus stood before the crowd at the Praetorium, this Barabbas fellow that we talked about earlier, he sat imprisoned in the Tower of Antonio some, I researched this, 1,500 feet away. So here's the Praetorium, the crowd yelling, all of this stuff. And over here, about across the road here, maybe up on that hill is 1,500 feet. That's where this prison is, and that's where Barabbas is located. Now, he would have been too far away to hear what Pilate was saying, but the loud answers from the crowd would surely have filled his cell. Pilate asked which prisoner the crowd wanted released, and the crowd shouted, Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Barabbas is hearing his name being called. He doesn't know what it's all about, but all of a sudden, this huge crowd is yelling his name. Pilate responded, as Matthew recorded, Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all said unto him, Let him be crucified. Pilate responded to this, Why, what evil hath he done? But Barabbas heard the crowd as they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Now, if you can picture yourself as Barabbas, you're in your cell, just hanging out there, 
like you have for however many weeks or days he's been there. And now all of a sudden in the distance, you hear your name being shouted. Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. And you know, what, what are they saying? And the next thing, you know, there's discussion going on. I don't find any fault in it. Uh, 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 crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Now, if you're Barabbas, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? They're calling my name and they're calling for me to be crucified. I, I know that I've been arrested for this. Maybe I've slid a few Roman soldiers' throats. They know I'm an insurrectionist. I know I'm going to die for this. And now they're calling my name and they're calling for me to be crucified. And now you hear some Roman soldiers coming up the hallway, the sound of keys, and your heart races as they unlock your door and it swings open. And you think, this is it for me. This is it for me. But instead of receiving death, you're set free. Can you imagine that? You think you're going to die that very hour, and now all of a sudden you're free. What does Barabbas find as he comes out of the dreary darkness into the daylight of Jerusalem on that Passover day? A crowd following now a bloodied man carrying a cross. It's a man who's been acquitted of all guilt, and yet he's walking by himself, having been condemned. Barabbas might ask, what, what's going on? And the truth unfolds. Barabbas, you were supposed to die, but this Jesus of Nazareth, he's dying on your, in your place. He's dying instead of you. Hearing the hammering blows as Jesus' feet and hands are nailed to the cross, you suppose Barabbas cried out in wonder, those blows were meant for me. But Jesus has taken my cross. I thought I was going to die. Now he's dying in my place. Of all the people in the world, only Barabbas can say that Jesus took his physical place on the cross. He took all our spiritual place. But he, he took Barabbas' spiritual or physical place on the cross. Barabbas was the one that should be nailed there, not him. In terms of God's holy judgment, all who believe in Jesus Christ today must say with Barabbas, Jesus died in my place. Donald Gray Barnhouse imagined this scene, and he wrote, It was I who deserved to die. It was I who deserved the wrath of God should be poured upon me. He was delivered up for my offenses. He was handed over to judgment because of my sins. This is why we speak of the substitutionary atonement. Christ was my substitute. He was satisfying the debt of divine justice and holiness. Paul put it in these memorable words. Some of you have this committed to memory. For he, meaning God, hath made him, meaning Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus bore our sin that we might bear his righteousness in God's presence forever. Jesus died so that we could live. Jesus was bound in the curse of sin so that we sinners might be set free from that curse. Like Barabbas in his cell, hearing his name loudly called, Every one of us will be called by name to appear at the great judgment seat of God's final judgment. We will all stand before God in judgment. On that great day, he will be wearing his crown of glory, enthroned as the judge over all, and all who refused him will be condemned forever. Now, will you have despised Jesus as the bloody Savior, like those who cried, crucify him? If instead you will call upon him to save you, your name will be called like Barabbas, but the divine calling will arrive to you to set you free. Free for what? Free from what? 
Well, Charles Wesley in his famous hymn says this, it's hymn number 731 in the Trinity hymnal. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's what's taking place here, folks. We follow Jesus through this world with many crosses of our own to bear in his name to an eternal glory that is secured for us by him to this very action. All who have lived in the gloomy dungeon of sin and unbelief can get this freedom simply by believing the gospel. Free to wear a salvation crown of glory to lay at Jesus' feet someday and free to sing with great joy. Again, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And so he did. And so he did. If you're a believer this morning, you have great reason to rejoice, to lift up your voices in singing his praise and your admiration for all that he did for you before and after the cross. Worship your king. Worship your prophet. Worship your priest. If you're an unbeliever today, you are among the crowd that said crucify him. You're among that crowd. I don't want him to be part of my life. I don't want his laws. I don't want his rules, his regulations. I want to live my way. Like Frank Sinatra saying, I did it my way. I want to live without this hanging over me. I want him out of my life. You can want that all you want, but someday you'll stand before him. As surely as he stood before Pilate, you will stand before him and you will give an account for your rejection of him. And that will send you to a Christless hell where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth for all eternity. Once you've been in hell for a thousand years, you got another thousand added to that and another thousand and a million and a million, million years. Eternity is such a long time. You've got 60, 70, maybe 80 years on this earth. And then there's eternity, either with Christ or without him. Today is the day of salvation. Repent and believe the gospel. Let's pray. Father, when we look at the, these scenes of God being tortured and mocked and then crucified, our, our, our hearts just can't remain cold. We can't remain indifferent to that. And when we realize that he was doing that for us, that when he was hanging on the cross, he had our names in mind. He had every one of our sins in mind and he was taking care of that sin problem. We can't just be indifferent to that. We see our, our Christ mocked and crucified, but then we see him resurrected three days later and we now see him sitting on his throne, interceding for us at this very moment. And we can't help but worship him we can't help but sing his praises. We can't help but rejoice that we are his chosen children, heirs and joint heirs right alongside him. We can't help but rejoice that in all eternity, we're going to be spending it with him in this glorious place called heaven, the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. We can't help but sing his praises. Lost people don't do that. But maybe today some lost person sees themselves as the guilty sinners that they are. Grant them faith, grant them repentance. Save your people, glorify yourself as we have attempted to glorify the name of Christ in our worship service today. Be pleased with us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.